So, the last three parables this morning, we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan. And then the two remaining will be the parable of the talents and the parable of the sower. And I purposefully kept these until the end because if there's anything that we probably as a group uh, know as much or more about, it's, it's these last, counting the one we did last week, these last four. If I have to talk about what the main point of the Good Samaritan is, then I'm not talking to this class. You follow what I'm saying? And we're going to spend a lot of time this morning about talking about context of this. Because that, understanding the context of this particular parable is paramount to how we go about acting as Christians on a daily basis. We've done a lot of parables in Luke. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that Luke has more than the rest do regarding this. And I think there's a lot to be said for Luke, the physician, and the compassion that he has in the way that he tells his gospel, which is to lift up Jesus Christ as a man. When we get to this particular parable about the compassion that this man showed the man on the side of the road, written in a way that... that I'm not going to say Luke is the only one that could have written it because obviously that's not true, but with the style that Luke writes, it just fits in the gospel thereof. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law, what is your reading of it? And that's important because rather than asking, or rather than, I'm sorry, rather than answering the question direct, Jesus turned the table and had the lawyer answer the question, answer his own question. So he, the lawyer, answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, that being the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? A little face saving, maybe, perhaps, on the part of the lawyer because he asked a question and he didn't expect to have to answer his own question. And the scripture indicates that he didn't really answer the, or ask the question with complete purity of heart. So he's got to have something to come back to say, okay, you didn't answer my first question. You made me answer it, so I'm going to get you to answer a question. And he says, who's my neighbor? Well, who is our neighbor? If I'm asking you in the, in the typical conversation, your neighbor... Does Joe need his hearing aid? Yes. How about that? Thank you. All righty. Who is your neighbor? Sitting in here this morning, who, if you ask the question this morning, who is your neighbor? It's not necessarily the one next door. Uh, it could be anywhere. It could be your neighbor. Uh, if this parable doesn't prove that, I don't know what does. Um, the entire world is our neighbor. Sitting in here this morning, your neighbor are those that you are closest to here within this group, isn't it? The saints that worship here at Palm Beach Lakes, even though you may live North County, South County, West County, wherever the, the case might be. Verse 30, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. You understand the meaning of who the priest is and what his function is. He was, he was from what tribe? He was a Levite. But there were certain, there were divisions within the Levite 
tribe in that priest had a certain function and did so. And then there were others of the Levite tribe who assisted the priests. All of their function was to direct worship towards God. Sacrifices, the rolling forward of sins and things of that nature that they handled and did for all the other 11 tribes of Israel. And if there's anyone that should be close to God, obviously it was the first guy who came by. It was the priest. Now maybe he wasn't on duty at that particular point in time. Uh, and, and you kind of chuckle, and I, I guess after I said it, I realized I, it was... I, I meant it, though, what I said, because they didn't serve every week. You know what I'm saying? They didn't serve 365 days a year. They were divided into 24 groups. Uh, you can look in... Um, I had the scripture right on the tip of my tongue, and I forgot where it was. I think it's Deuteronomy 24. It's something 24. I'll find it in a little bit. And look at what the divisions were. And so there were groups of them that served as being the high priest. And they did it um, according to things that I find exterior to the Bible. Typically a week at a time, a couple of weeks a year. So they broke it up. All right. And then there were others who did the assisting and did the work that, that of preparing the sacrifices and things of that nature. But as Levites... They were all involved at this, even though actively the priest might not have been the acting priest on that particular day. But regardless of that, he walked by on the other side. Verse 32, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper. He said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend. When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell amongst the thieves? And he the lawyer, said, He who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The lawyer answered two questions. He answered both of them correctly. And Jesus made his point. What's the context, though? Because I want to talk about the context for a good little bit here this morning. What has happened prior to this in chapter 10 when we look at what Jesus has ask his disciples to do. What happened in the first part of chapter 10? He sent out the 70. What did the 70 do? Where were they going? Who did they preach to? He told them to take what with them? Nothing. Don't take anything with you. I need you to go out and just preach. Do you think that those 70 went out and ran into, as a, in a majority of the time that they were preaching, people that they knew. Was that the point? Going through the neighborhood and talking to the next door neighbor? They were going all out to the countryside, into other cities. And they were taking the gospel to different places, and they were talking to people they did not know. What was the result of this, by the way? Were they successful? Very successful, were they not? Look in uh, verse 17, chapter 10, verse 17. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were excited because that which they went out and did, they had success at. They preached, and people listened, and people responded. They performed signs and did things that allowed them to teach the gospel. Who was their neighbor at that particular point? You know, that's part of the context. Let's back up to chapter 9 and look at some more of the context. Chapter 9, verse 49 
Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. We've discussed this scripture previously in this class, this quarter, as we talked about looking at being a, a, a part of or having a mindset of being part of a group that keeps everything close in, not projecting outward. Do we want to be that group that, that feels as if though we have a lock on certain truths and those truths only belong to us? And that's not what Christianity is about, but sometimes that's what we feel like. I'm not sure why. What was Jesus' answer to this? What did he tell those? What did he tell John? Look, if he's not against us, he's with us. He's doing this in my name. The implication there is if he's able to do these things, he's doing it with the direct authority of Jesus. And so he preaches and he goes out and he, and he talks to others. And John's upset because he's not with the group that's physically following Jesus on a regular basis. That's wrong on John's part. Dirk, did you have a comment? Yeah, it's an interesting contrast to the other event where someone was trying to cast a demon out. The demon said, you know Paul, you, we don't see where you live and you left on him. And overpowered him. It shows the contrast. And apparently this, this person that they're referring to believed and was actively trying to do what he was supposed to do. But the other guy was probably just trying to do something fancy for people to be afraid of him. And by implication, this particular person was successful at what they did. And John took exception to that. Verse 50, But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. He's doing things in our name. He's doing good and positive things in our name. He's doing things that are in keeping with my word. And doing so properly. Leave him alone. Don't pull in. Expand outward. Verse 51. Let's talk about more context. Let's get a little bit deeper into the context. Let's talk about those Samaritans. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. You understand what we're talking about Jesus is recognizing there? He's recognizing that it's almost time or getting close to the period of time when He is going to go to heaven, when He is going to go into Jerusalem, when He is going to be crucified, when He's going to be put in a grave, resurrected, come back, or, and then later ascend into heaven. That's what He recognizes it's time for here. And so it's time to head that way. Verse 52, And he sent messengers before him, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Why would that Samaritan village not accept or allow Jesus to pass through? Why did he even need to ask for that matter? I thought about the military concept or, or what we've seen happen militarily in ser several circumstances and in the last few decades. We have a war that's being fought on a foreign territory. We have soldiers who are stationed in a particular place and they need to get from where they are stationed to somewhere else. Have we, have we seen circumstances in which our military was not allowed to pass through over or over other territories and countries? And that's kind of what's happening here. Jesus wants to go to Jerusalem. He needs as a direct route to go through a Samaritan village. The Samaritan village stops him at, or stops his, his disciples at the front and says, Who are you and why, where are you going and why are you coming through here? Now, what is Jesus? What are his disciples ethically? ethnically? They're Jews. What are those Samaritans going to say about those Jews coming through our village? Not coming through my village. 
Why would they be like that? We've got a little history, and we're going to explore some of that history here in just a second. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? What was John and James's answer to that village that would not let them go through? They wanted to nuke them. They wanted to take them off the face of the earth right there. Bring fire to them and destroy them because they would not let the Lord Jesus go through. Is that what Jesus wanted to do? It absolutely is not. Now, think about that because with that relationship, we're going to go into a parable about who is my neighbor, about Christian love and action, and we're going to use as the central character a Samaritan. In 722 B.C., Assyria came in and took Israel into captivity. And they went into, um, I think it was Hosea that was king of Israel at that particular time. And they took Samaria, well, that's where the capital was, and they took it captive. And in the process of doing that, they took people out. It's not uncommon. You go in, you take a place over mil militarily, and you take some of those people out of there and you put them in other locations and you bring other people from other locations and fill in the, the void. Why do you do something like that? What are you trying to do with the people you just conquered? Well, for one thing, you're trying to keep them subjected, right? And in doing so, when you take them out of their home and put them in a place that they're not familiar with, you work towards breaking their will. And that's what the circumstance was here. Those Samaritans, or Samarians, either way, were taken out. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. Go there with me. Let's look at a few verses. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 17. Let's go with verse 6 first. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Halah and by the Haber, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Look down in verse 24 next, please. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Cutha, Ava, Hamath, and from some place that I don't want to pronounce, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in the cities. So what did we have? We took some people out. We brought some people in. The people we took out went other places than what their home was. The people that they brought in didn't know anything about the customs of the land that they were brought into. We just did a people swap. Now this is 722, give or take, B.C. Just keep that in the back of your head. Now chapter 17 has got a very interesting story about what happened to those people that were brought in. They started to get eaten by lions. Now, perhaps they tasted better, smelled better than the people who were there previous. Perhaps the lions were especially hungry. Perhaps this was something that that was the hand of God working. I don't know why they were being eaten by lions, but the fact is that they were. And Assyria's response to it, I thought, was, is rather unique. Because what did the king of Assyria say when he looked at all these different people that were, or heard the complaints about the people being eaten by lions? Well, it must be because we've put people in their land and those people that we put there don't know the customs of the gods of that particular place. And so how we're going to fix this is we're going to send in priests from those people that we took out and they're going to go in to where they came from and they're going to teach the people that we put in there all the customs of the gods of that land. Did it work? 
I don't know, it may have worked regarding the being eaten by lions because I don't know a lot else about that other than that, that first verse in chapter 17. Did it work in, in terms of teaching them the customs and, and restoring the practices of Israel regarding the sacrifices and the gods? Uh, are they one true God? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Because if you look at chapter 17, what you see is this incredible hodgepodge of two worlds of religions that have been put together. Because the people sacrificed to God, but then they had their own gods. And they kind of co-mingled and morphed everything into one big pot. And what came out of it was probably less recognizable to God than what it was going into it. And that's what chapter 17 is about. Now, those people that were taken out, typically not 100% of the population, but rather the leading citizens, and some would have been left behind. Jeremiah chapter 41 indicates as, as much when it talks about those that were potentially left there. And so what happens over the years as we go about with a few Jews that are left and they intermarry with those that have been brought in from other places and then what happens as far as the purity of the genealogy of the Jewish people who were there? It becomes less so, does it not? And in the process of becoming less so, we start to see this terrible conflict of, of hatred come about between the, the, the Jew and the Samaritan. They did not like each other. Not in the least little bit. The Jews, and you know, when I was a kid, the way I always heard this story, it, I would be in vacation Bible school or I would be Bible class and we'd study this parable and, and the teacher would say something along the lines of, and these Samaritans were half-breeds. And that was offensive to the Israelites. Well, there wasn't any half about it. A point one of point one of point one of point one percent probably by the time we get to the time of Christ. What had, what had those Israelites that were left there in Samaria done that God told them not to do? They had gone outside of the Israelites. They had married those that were not Israelites. And as a result of that, what happened to all the commandments and things that God sent forward? They kind of became just in the back of their head, I'm not anything that they really needed to do. They quit being um, commandments and they started being suggestions. And everything kind of went to pot. All right, fast forward 100, well, two, uh, in round terms, 200 years. Um, 536, somewhere in that neighborhood. Zerubbabel is leading a group to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. In Ezra chapter 4, there is discussion that the Samaritans, and it doesn't mention them in, in that particular text as being Samaritans, but that's who we're talking about. And they requested to help rebuilding the temple. Now, if you read Ezra chapter 4, and you read it closely, I think you can question as to whether or not their offer of help was sincere. I don't care which way you read it. I don't think it's that important as to whether it was or wasn't sincere. Because if it was sincere, they were rebuffed, and then they spent time trying to stand in the way of rebuilding the temple. If it wasn't sincere, then they wanted to stand in the way of rebuilding the temple from the get-go. I don't care. Doesn't matter. What was the point? They offered. The Jews said, no, not you. You're not about to have a part of this. They probably didn't really want to be a part of it anyway because they hated the Jews as much as the Jews hated them. And so we got hatred. Been festering now for 200 years, minimum. Now we go to the first century B.C. And um, Bill Jr. is more of an expert on this than I am. Bill, so if you hear me say something wrong from this point, you just correct me, okay? 
I think it was the Maccabean Wars. The Jews actually fought against the Samaritans during that period of time. The Samaritans had established Mount Gerizim as their holy place because they believed that's where Abraham offered Isaac. The Israelites believed it was Mount Moriah. And so during this period of conflict in about 100 or so B.C., the Jews came in and wiped out the temple that was on the top of Mount Gerizim that belonged to the Samaritans. If you were a Samaritan, how would you feel about it at that particular point in time? Did we just do anything that helped this relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews? All right, fast forward another hundred years. In or about or around somewhere 9 or 10 or 11 A.D., during Passover, Josephus talks about a group of Samaritans who came in and scattered dead men's bones through the temple. Hmm. So how about those Samaritans and those Israelites? How much did they like each other? We're talking 750 years of hatred. That's longer than the Hatfields and McCoys. What was it all about? Does it matter after 750 years what it, it's all about? And so at the time of Jesus, how did those Samaritans feel about the Jews and how did the Jews feel about the Samaritans? And we get to chapter 10 of Luke and we're going to have a story about Christian love and action. And we're going to use it in it as the main character a Samaritan. That's what I want to sink in this morning when we're talking about the actions of that Samaritan. How much that hatred was, how deep it was within their souls. And yet when it came time to act, what did the Samaritan do? Do we have people that we don't like? It's okay to say yes, by the way. You know, I, there are a few people on the face of this planet that I do not like. Probably more so I can remember when our boys were in that wonderful time that we call adolescence that Debbie and I would have to correct a particular behavior. And I know that I've said, and Debbie said on more than one occasion, you know, son, I love you because I'm your mom or dad, but I really do not like you tonight. Have you ever said that to your kids? Some of you probably say, no, I can't believe he would say that to his children. <laughs> but I did <laughs> because they disappointed me on that particular occasion. And you know what I meant. I didn't approve of what they did. You know, go and sin no more. You love the person, you disapprove of the sin. But there are people that we don't really think fondly of. And what happens if they befall some tragedy? What's our responsibility as a Christian? You know, I didn't talk about the main point this morning of this, of this parable. I, I went straight into the context. But what is the main point of this wonderful story that we all know and you guys know as well as I do? Isn't it about Christian love and that that Christian love manifests itself in Christian action? And we have things that we need to do and should do because we are Christians even though we might not want to do them? Fran. It's an unconditional love. Uh, <laughs> Fran's point is that there are times when God doesn't like us much either. You know? And you can go back and you can look in the story of the Israelites in the years they were in the the wilderness, and you can see the circumstances in which God wanted to say, I've had enough, or what God did say, I've had enough 
and Moses interceded on their behalf and said, no, you know, there's value here. There's worth here. And so time went forward and, and God forgave them and, and good things were done even though there were consequences to pay for that particular, uh, for that particular sin. Uh, what is our duty as a Christian? Literally. When, when we look and, and see someone who's in distress, is there, is there anything that requires us to look first to see what their nationality is? Or what their ethnicity is? Or the color of their skin? Or anything that gets in the way of us doing a Christian service? Who is my brother? Who is my neighbor? You know, Galatians chapter 6, do good unto all, and especially those of the household of faith. But what was the first commandment? Do good to all people. Did the Samaritan do good to all people? There wasn't anything about this neighbor business that had anything to do with geography or genealogy. We can draw no conclusion other than everyone is our neighbor. Look in John chapter 13, verse 35. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What does the world see? Is it easy for me to love you here this morning? I mean, this is not even an effort, is it? What happens this afternoon when we go to lunch and then we're in a hurry to get back home because the dog needs to get a bath or whatever the case might be. And we run into someone who's down and out, whether we know them or not. What does the world see when they see us as Christians? And that's what this parable is all about. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. What do we call that? The golden rule. We kind of gloss over it because it's been overused, don't we? Sometimes we don't even think about it as being scripture. We think at it about it as coming from Benjamin Franklin's Almanac, Poor Richard's Almanac. But it's scripture, isn't it? You know, there are court Fran. I especially like a hot cold thing. The hot cold thing? Yeah, they do something and they don't say they do hot cold bombs. Oh, yeah, I got you. Heaping the hot heaping the hot coals on them. You know, According to, I, sidestep for just a minute, let me make sure I get this right. I picked this up, I, I didn't know if I was going to actually use it in class this morning. Um, according to William Barclay, and it, it, you've probably heard of Barclay, he was a commentator, he was a professor of theology, I think, at um, University of, now I forget, something, Scotland. He died in the 70s. He was a 20th century commentator. He goes on, and he's done some studies on Jewish law and some other things. If a wall were to collapse on a person on the Sabbath day, 
a Jew was allowed to remove just enough of the stones in order to determine if the person who was under the wall was Jewish or a Gentile. And if they were Jewish, then the rest of the stones could be removed. And if they were a Gentile, the stones remained. And if the person lived till the next day, then they could be dealt with. That's how pharisaical things had become. How legalistic things had become to the Pharisees. Is there anything in that story that even resembles Christianity? And the answer to that certainly is no. 1 Corinthians 13, we need to go there to finish up. You know the chapter. You know what the chapter is called. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How will they know that we are Christians? By our love, right? Chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Do we understand when we're looking at verse 3 that it's not enough to do the right thing, it has to be done the right way? Go down to verse 13, please. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And how will they know we are Christians? We sing it in a song, don't we? By our love. Questions or comments? No? Oh, do you want to get out, do you want to get out early? <laughs> You know, favorite teacher was always the teacher who let the class out early. All right, um, two more parables to go. What did I say they were? We got the sower, and um, now I've lost track in my head. The talents, the sower and the talents. John? Two of the Jewish what? Leaders. John's point, uh, spot on it is, regarding servant leadership, as the parable talks about these two men that were, were known as leaders, who were defined as leaders, but yet were overlooking, and I'm paraphrasing what John said, obviously, but overlooking the point that it's about servant leadership, then as it is today. Okay? Thank you. Dismissed.